me, uh, time to introduce Taria Wilson. So Taria was born on a dairy farm in Cheshire and moved to North Lancashire in uh, 1990 to work in countryside management. She's been working with farmers in North Lancashire and much more recently in the Yorkshire Dales for over 30 years. So if you're all okay there, Taria, and you've got your screen share ready, I shall stop my share and hand across to yourself. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good evening. Um, thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, um, as I mentioned, well, John picked up on before, I'm actually uh, broadcasting from Lancashire. So just over the border from perhaps most of you, maybe in Yorkshire, though, some of you from Cumbria and Lancashire as well, maybe. So um, I work with the farm conservation team in um, the Yorkshire Dales National Park. And I'm currently actually, I am um, I'm a management advisor with the team, but I'm currently on secondment to um, a time limited program called Farming in Protected Landscapes, which uh, I can give you a little brief overview a little bit later, which is a DEFRA funded program um, to help farmers get through the agricultural transition plan and enable them to become more resilient for the future in terms of the farm businesses with particular emphasis on um, the environment as well. So I was just this evening, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background and overview about some of the work that um, we, we support farmers with and land managers um, across the National Park. So I don't know um, if any of you want to have a guess, but uh, you can leave this in the questions and answers if you like. I've got a few different pictures throughout the presentation of different locations. So if you want to plummet a guess at some of them, uh, feel free. So uh, just some statistics about the National Park. So just over a thousand farms, um, as you can imagine, that's um, quite a few different families to potentially work to work with. Um, so we rely on a, a combination of people approaching us and us approaching them. And then quite, sometimes when we've worked with a, a particular farmer or farming family, quite often the neighbors just disappearing over the fence or the wall and, uh, and then maybe approaches us as well. And the reason why we work with farmers is because the majority of the land is actually privately owned. And so that their management is actually key key to the management of the national park here and this is very this is quite typical of the whole country as well so in terms of upland hill farming um typical upland farm um is quite often generational though just more recently there are more changes perhaps in terms of art farm ownership and that um, new people are coming into farming more so now than have done uh, perhaps over the last couple of generations so in some areas, you will start to see a change as um, new types of farmers or new, new people come into the, into the industry. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a job. It's, it's a lifestyle that has an impact on all members of the family. And quite often, several generations are involved. So the National Park Authority, we have um, a land management section. Um, which um, includes the farm conservation team. And then we work very closely with trees and woodlands team and wildlife conservation as well, and supported by um, Dales volunteers, uh, some of them who've got particular specialisms um, and interest areas that uh, um, we, we, which we do welcome and we help with training and support with this as well. So the temporary posts um, are linked to projects, some of the which I'll mention a little bit later. So uh, that's why we quite often run temporary posts. And it's not unusual for organisations to have core staff and then have temporary posts, uh, which are time limited linked to projects. So a different valley, a different dale. Um, so ways we can work with farmers in which we do. So it could be informal advice, or we also provide more formal advice as well. And we do have the opportunity sometimes um, and at different times of the year, depending on our capacity, but also the skill set of what we've got within our service um, to carry out surveys. And um, this is carried out across the board. So members of our wildlife conservation team and trees and woodlands team as well, plus volunteers help us out with the survey side. 
uh, filling out grant application forms and prepare, helping them prepare the maps using the RGIS systems. Um, that, that's often quite a great help to farmers in, in particular who are applying for grants. Uh, they need quality maps as well as um, the forms being filled out in the right way as well. Uh, and then we work with farmers through um, certain projects, some of which you might be familiar with. So Wensleydale, Payment by Results is just about coming to an end. It's a pilot project um, which has been run in a couple of locations. There's some arable um, projects and then there's some abroad, for example, in Ireland and across um, in Europe as well, because it was part of a European funded to start with. And in Wensleydale, the farmers who participate in this project, um, their focus was on hay meadow management and management for breeding waders. And they're testing and have been testing an approach where rather than being given a set payment per hectare to manage the land and quite a prescriptive approach where they're given stocking levels or they're given certain dates when they cut the hay or the machine operations, etc., it's, it's turned on its head slightly in that they're the outcomes that they wish to achieve. The advisor works with the farmer to agree those outcomes, and then the farmer decides how they're going to actually get there. T Swell Naturally Connected is um, a lottery funded project which um, includes Swale Dell and Arkham Golf Dell in terms of the Yorkshire Dells National Park Authority. And we have some staff based up at uh, Bainbridge who uh, work on that project. And then um, a project that's recently started, Our Common Cause, which is um, the Common Land Foundation. They have some commons elsewhere, but the ones in um, the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority that are covered by this project are Ringleborough, Crossington Mall and Brant Fell. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of countryside stewardship. So this is the main um, agri-environment support scheme that's been available to farmers. And it's, it's been around for quite a while, but it's had different names and it's been, and it has uh, um, the, the approach and the grant levels, et cetera, have changed. But it was first piloted right back in the late, well, late 80s, early 90s. And it was called Countryside Stewardship in those days. And then it went through another approach of environmental stewardship. And then it's recently... Well, in the last few years, it's been rebranded as Countryside Stewardship and the, the grant rates and some of the examples I'm going to give you are actually the current uh, grant scheme that's available. So, excuse me. <coughs> it's a national scheme. You can apply for capital grants only. So I've shown some at the top there of the types of um, grants that they can apply for. So the boundaries is dry stone walls, hedgerows, and then trees and orchards. So, for example, down in Dorset, they might include some of the banks, etc. Whereas up here, our hedges, you know, up in the north, like in um, Lancashire and Yorkshire, tend to mainly be hedges that are laid, for example, on or off banks. Uh, whereas the other two areas, water quality and air quality, are linked very much to national targets of working um, to targets that the government set. So, the air quality grants, the more re most recent ones that have been added to the um, grants that are available. Now, farmers can also consider applying for um, a grant scheme that would last five years or 10 years, depending on which type of options they're going for. And this is um, kind of scored. And so what they do is they submit an application and they might be offered the application or they might not, depending on how, how well they've put the application together. And they can have a combination of revenue and capital grants in these five and 10 year agreements. So the same capital grants are available as in the standalone ones, but there are extra ones available as well. So the Countryside Duty also has a grant scheme called Woodland Creation, and then another one which is focused on woodland management. So some examples of revenue grants available for Countryside Stewardship. So in the uplands, um, you might be aware there's what's something called less favoured area status. And um, as you get higher up the hill, there's a boundary where it changes from less favoured area to severely disadvantaged area. So some of the options in the severely disadvantaged area, which is SDA, are lower paying than those in the lower lying areas. Because it's likely that actually the, the grasslands in the area above the SDA line 
have had the least amount of improvements in terms of um, in fertilizer or, um, or other uh, applications, etc. So if you were to look at the dales, I've, I've put some options up here that um, are used quite regularly or that we look to work with farmers on looking at well, managing their land. And I'll give you a few examples coming up now. So if we go back to this meadow, which has been surveyed, you can probably see this the sweeter meadows actually if you go up the valley. And this particular meadow um, is eligible for an applicate um, for these two grants, which stack on top of each other. The GS6 is a species rich grassland. So the criteria for that are quite tight. Um, so as part of the survey, um, the number of the types of species and, the, and their frequency are recorded and at the time of the survey, and then there'll be a repeat survey towards the end of the application as well. And then the second grant fund is an additional payment for agreeing to take a hay cut, um, which has requirements, for example, at the moment, um, the date for the hay cut is usually after the 15th of July, but for some farmers this works well because they do lay hay cuts anyway. Other farmers might struggle with it because they really have to rely on how the weather goes and sometimes have to take a risk of taking the hay cut a bit earlier. The reason for the late hay cut, which you're probably aware, is it allows the majority of the grass and the plant seeds to set seed and therefore drop into the sward, which gets scarified as the hay gets cut and therefore allowed to get back into the soils and, and continue to germinate in the following seasons. We're really fortunate in terms of um, the North Pennines, Forest of Boland, Yorkshire Dales, that we're a very strong, good stronghold for breeding waders. Um, snipe, that's a snipe nest just on the left. They might just be able to make out there's three little eggs. I nearly trod on this one. It just shows you how easy it is. Um, the, I was fortunate because snipe actually sit very tight on the nest and it lifted just at the point when I was approaching it. So I stopped. And, I was, and that's where I realised I had to, you know, work out where the nest was before I made any, made any further changes to where I was going. So as well as snipe, the ones that um, are easier to survey and probably notice more are the curlew and the lapwing and less familiar um, red shanks. So they, and then we have the oyster catchers. So they're the key, they can, they're the main species that um, will use the different types of inby land and moorland that we have in these upland hill farming areas. So this particular field is got quite an open sward. Farmers cutting the rushes on a rotation. Down at this bottom end of the field, he's um, is slightly damper and he's leaving the rushes a little bit denser down there. And probably the snipe would maybe keep to that area, whereas that more open sward is ideal for lapwing. Curly would tend to prefer more your rougher grassland areas where there's a bit more cover. So like the snipe and curly rely on camouflage, whereas the lapwing, it's really important for the lapwing to be able to see predators above them as well as predators on the ground. So the chicks are very well camouflaged in the eggs, but the, the adults less so. Um, so in terms of payment rates uh, for the farmer, um, they've got the options and which is what we talked to them about and discuss the management options about the machine movements, about the stocking levels, etc. is um, a, a basic payment of £88 for the per hectare. And if cattle grazing, because cattle, if you mix cattle with sheep, you tend to get better sward structure because of the way they graze, but also you get more hoof prints, you tend to get wetter, damper areas where the invertebrates can breed. Um, and so that cattle grazing supplement on top of that. Um, starts to make the payment more attractive for the farmer to consider. And if there's a um, quite a dense rush issue for the first three years, there's an additional payment available to carry out rush management. And what is also worth looking at is the existing water features that are there or the muddy areas. So there's actually a capital plant available to create these very shallow pools called scrapes or to break out like kind of linear gutter features or reprofile ditches. And that's an example of just a, a little small scrape that a farmer's you know, created on a slightly higher bit of land, which is probably more likely to support um, curlew. There will be lapping up there as well, but it moving more into curlew territory. 
So um, in terms of surveys, we're very fortunate that we've actually got quite a strong network of volunteers that help us, including Jeff as well, um, and some of our staff members as well. So um, the range of experience varies. You know, so people come to us with no experience at all or very little, and they they um, develop or others come to us with quite, um, some quite strong bird knowledge, but perhaps not so aware about habitats. So we carry out annual um, training courses and we look at how to assess habitats and consider suitable habitat features. And then the methodology that we use, which is based on the BTO methodology, but what it is a BTO methodology that we use for um, assessing breeding waders. And the reason why we do these surveys is to help us plan in conjunction with the farmers about which land's appropriate to include in their grant applications. And then for those that commit to a five-year grant um, programme, they have to submit um, at the point of their grant claim in year five, a independent survey that's carried out by somebody who isn't a member of the farming family. Um, and we usually only do these with staff because um, we, we, charge, we charge a nominal fee for doing that survey. Some examples of some capital grants that are quite popular with farmers in terms of dry stone walling, hedge laying, and then fencing linked to land management and or to riparian buffer strips or tree planting areas. So this particular farmer um, has used um, this grant combination on, on some of the land, they will only be eligible for the walling grant plus the top wiring, whereas in other locations where it might be that the foundations are a lot more tricky to get established or the access to the site is very remote and or it's on a steep slope, then there's a difficult site supplement available. Now, this is only available through higher tier. It's not available through mid tier and um, the cap um, the capital grant scheme because the idea of the capital grant standalone applications is is that the RPA have just minimal um, intervention in it. It's um, the applications are submitted and they carry out their checks and award the grant or don't award it. Whereas in a higher tier application, the Natural England provide extra support to make assessments on suitability and appropriate the appropriate use of grants. Um, another grant that's available, management of infield barns. It's quite well used, this one, and um, wildlife boxes. So the small, medium and large, depending on whether they're tree boxes, say for tree sparrows, or whether it's a large box for a barn owl or a kestrel. These grants are only linked to maintenance of the barns. The actual restoration of barns there has been, there is a separate grant scheme available, but it's quite limited at the moment. It's only available in some very um, small pots of money in, in areas on uh, a limited basis. So, as an example of a, a barn owl box that um, the farmer had made actually by some volunteers based at um, Gale, I'm trying to think of the name. There's, a, um, there's an old um, water wheeled place there and uh, they're quite into joinery and that so they uh, they were commissioned to make several barn owl boxes and um, we have um, a few um, registered BTO um, sorry registered ringers um, who help at the barn owl monitoring as well. This particular barn actually had uh, jackdaws in the roof and it has done for two three years and using the outside access, this is actually a kestrel nest. So that particular farm, this is a combination of um, records from the farmer and from a person who lives nearby who walks through the farm on a daily basis. And the some of the surveys that we've carried out um, by myself or through volunteers as well. So it's a nice selection uh, of combination of birds who use the upland allotments and the moorland right down through kind of the little gills, the woody gills, um, through to the breeding wader land and then down to the rivers. Mm -hmm. 
So, Woodland Creation, there's been quite a bit, a little bit of change with Woodland Creation um, grants of recently, and there's a, a scheme that's re reasonably recent called England Woodland Creation Offer, which offers a better grant rate than the previous Woodland Creation. And the Woodland Trust now have a, um, a large um, programme running. They, they've had more woods running for a while, and they're now just starting a new program called Grow Back Greener. And part of that funding is coming directly to be delivered through the National Park. And so, for example, our, our Trees and Woodlands team have got some extra temporary staff in at the moment to help um, the Woodland Trust with this, this big grant program as well. Yorkshire Dales Millennium Trust have run and still continue to run a grant scheme that's more targeted at smaller tree planting schemes and community-based schemes. So these are the new grant rates for the England Woodland Creation Grant Offer, which is managed by the Forestry Commission. So the grant rates have improved from what they have been for the last five years. And what you might be interested in is um, natural recolonisation for the first time is now el eligible for grant support. Up till now, it's always been about planting new trees, whereas um, they finally <laughs> brought on board, which uh, has been quite a push for about natural regeneration, natural recolonisation. Strike markers, these are, you might be aware, of these are little plates that you put on the top wire of the fence to connect the top two wires to reduce the likelihoods of um, birds such as red grouse, but black grouse and breeding wades, those lower flying birds hitting the top of the fence. Infrastructure, which um, there's a 40% grant available based on the quote. That's for example tracks and turning circles, etc., linked to woodland creation. Whereas recreational infrastructure is linked to public access. And that's why it's at a 100% rate. And then once the woodlands are established, um, for the first 10 years, there's an annual maintenance. Um, Grant available provided they've fulfilled the criteria um, to help them manage that woodland for the 10 years, first 10 years. This is um, quite a large area of stewardship that um, is, we have a very good uptake of in the Yorkshire Dales. We're fortunate in that um, Natural England actually um, employ catchment sensitive farming offices across the country. However, there's a separate agreement that has been for quite a few years in the Yorkshire Dales that those catchment sensitive farming offices are actually um, the contracts with the National Park Authority. So they're part of our farm conservation team. And it is proven to work really well, partly because we've already got existing relationships with some of these farmers and partly because the staff are based on the ground more locally. And there's continuity of staff, whereas it tends to be a, more of a turnover of staff um, within Natural England itself. And um, you can apply as a capital grant. We mentioned earlier on about water quality, air quality. If they include these capital grants within a mid-tier IA tier, there's no actual financial cap on the at the top end. Though obviously they, they are uh, verified and they're scrutinised about the eligibility grants. So these are focused on water and air quality improvements. Um, additional funding. Um, this is there's lots more than this, but I've just given you a little bit of a flavour of some of the areas of funding that we of organisations that we work with. So Rivers Trusts, whether it's to do with water quality, and more recently there's been quite a a big um, emphasis on natural flood management and working to see if we can get the natural flood management to work. Um, yeah, Yorkshire Lancashire and Cumbria Wildlife Trust, whether it's to do with hay meadow management, peatland management, etc., they they lead on some of these projects in the lead organisation. In terms of communities, um, Swindon Quarry, um, which is down in the south part of the park, there's a cluster of parishes around there where this this grant fund is available um, for in particular community based projects. But um, there's been there's a few that um, have come out of that, and it's worth thinking about if you're working with communities down that end or with farmers. And then I've just put at the bottom um, Defra. 
Um, I've got these three grant programs currently running. The bottom one's actually just been launched today. And um, the reasoning behind this is, um, I don't know if you're aware, as part of the agricultural transition plan, um, there's quite change in cut farm support happening. And it started this year in terms of what's called the basic payment scheme. It used to be called single farm payment. You might think of it that way, is that the, the grant, the support through basic payment scheme, which farmers, as long as they register their land and they've and they've got it registered correctly and they put the claims in correctly, they were entitled to support linked to the area of land that they had. So this is gradually being phased out over seven years. And the money is being redirected into different um, grant support and different uh, ways of uh, look, um, environmental management in particular. So countryside stewardship will soon evolve into environmental land management or ELM, you might have heard it referred to. Um, definitely prefer to call it ELM, environmental land management, because it was potentially a confusion with Dutch ELM disease. So I wanted to ensure that people were, were comfortable with that. It's, it's, it's about agri-environment, it's, it's that evolving. And they've already started piloting the sustainable farming in, in incentive that's started this year. Um, and next year they will be starting to pilot the, as they see it, the next level up, which is about farmers not just working on their own farm boundary, but perhaps in conjunction with a few neighbours, and that's called local nature recovery. And then they are will soon be inviting applications for the highest kind of level tier, which is um, landscape recovery, which will only be as, as um, and limited number of very large scale landscape um, projects on, in terms of environmental change. So the Farming and Protected Landscapes Programme is um, for National Parks and Eel and Bees. It's a three year programme that was launched in July this year. It's available till March, end of March, 2024. And some of this money that has come out of the basic payment scheme has been put into this fund along with the Farming Resilience Fund and the Farming Investment Fund. And the Farming and Protective Landscapes Programme has got four key themes, climate, nature, people and place. And the grant applications must link to the National Park Management Plan. So if it's in the Yorkshire Dales, so for example, it's in the Forest of Holland only, it'll link back to their management plan. And there are dedicated teams um, who've been appointed to work on these programmes and help farmers um, apply for them. And then the actual applications are assessed by a local assessment panel, which includes four farmers, the one for the Yorkshire Dells National Park Authority, for example. The Future Farming Resilience Fund is only available till uh, end of March next year. And it's a, there's 19 organisations across the UK. The farmer can choose any one of those, depending on what um, support they need. But it's effectively equivalent to £1,000 worth of advice and guidance to help them prepare their business for the future. Some of them are more focused on um, looking at um, uh, succession planning, for example, family succession planning. Others might be looking more focused on whether they want to go down the environmental route more. Others might be going down the route of whether they need to address some key issues in terms of infrastructure on their farms, for example. And this fund that's just been launched today, the Farming Investment Fund, is actually um, an evolution of a fund that's been running for a couple of years called the Farm Productivity Grant. So it's about providing um, investment uh, grants available for farm infrastructure and items such as, for example, sheep handling pens, etc. And um, other uh, machinery that might make a difference to how the farm evolves. I've come to the end of my presentation. Another Dale, well, perhaps I wouldn't call this a Dale actually. Um, the, um, I, I deliberately put this one on because perhaps this is um, uh, one that might help stimulate some discussion or questions about how you might individually vision, visualize what this could look like in 10 years, 50 years time, 100 years time, or maybe it should change. 
not change at all. Maybe it should stay as it is, because I'm guessing there'll be quite a cross section of views, or potentially, if you were to look at that land from the valley bottom right to the valley top, including the the gills, etc. Thank you, David. John, I'll hand over back to you. Thanks, Daria. That's so important that we understand the um, way the landscape is farmed, because clearly so much of the region is farmed and it has such an impact on, on nature and nature recovery around the region. Um, we do have a fair few questions already. I'd ask people if they have further questions to put them in the Q&A and I'll, uh, I'll ask Taria those. But uh, also, yes, it, it, it would be interesting if people wanted to make comment on how they would love to see the, the landscape in the picture either stay as it is or change going forwards. And we'll get a bit of discussion going. So first off on the questions goes back to some of the information about tree planting grants. What are the criteria about what kind of trees are planted and how close together they are? Okay, so um, the density of trees, number of trees will depend on what you're trying to achieve or what your vision is for that, that, for that tree planting. So um, I mentioned about recolonizations um, and natural, re you know, natural region now is, uh, is available through grant support. But the other side to it as well, that's becoming uh, more important is wood pasture as well. So tree densities or shrub densities in wood pasture areas is quite low. And there's benefits in terms of shade and shelter for livestock. You tend to get a different kind of ground flora that grows up in the wood pasture than you would in a dense woodland. And there are definite medicinal and health benefits to livestock. And um, some parts of the world have never lost their wood pasture kind of farming, whereas part, most of the UK have. But there's more and more farmers interested in that kind of um, moving towards that. Whereas if you were looking at a gill, so this, this particular gill hasn't got black grouse, but say if you were looking at this gill between these two hills, for example, you might be looking still at quite a low density and maybe more scrubby cover. You might be thinking of black grouse or, and, or ring oozel. So it depends what your kind of objectives are and your vision, but you need to look at the underlying geology, look at what's already going on there, thinking about deer, deer numbers, about livestock numbers, about managing livestock, um, or whether there's going to be active deer management going on. And then as you get closer to watercourses, if you were looking at grant support from the Forestry Commission, you're getting to quite high densities by the time you get back to the, the rivers and the streams because part of the aim is about water quality and about natural flood management. So the densities go, are going up to about 1,100 up to about 1,600 stems per hectare, which is quite high by the time you get to that mm -hmm. density. That's great, Taryn. It really illustrates the complexity of being site specific and depending on objectives and so on. So, uh, yeah. Uh, as with so many of these things, no, no very simple answer. Um, a couple of comments, actually, more than questions from Michael Clark. Good evening, Michael, from, uh, from Scotland, from the Nature Friendly Farming Network in Scotland. Michael's jealous of the generous grants available to farmers in the Dales uh, and says it's absolutely the right approach to hear so many references to a helping hand for farmers. Um, I guess that sort of feeds into the the question about what's the response from farmers to the changing grant uh, position? You know, how do you find they're varying in their embracing or staying away from it? How do you get their trust as to what's going to happen in the future? I think you probably said it in your question, actually. It, it varies an awful lot. And that might be partly down to age. It might be partly down to their financial situation. You know, the pressures that they're under. Some of them um, are so involved with their farm business and, and they, they don't actually have the courage to take time to step back, actually, to, to reassess it because they feel they can't afford to do it. Whereas others um, see it as an opportunity. Um, some farmers see it as an opportunity to pass on to another generation now. Potentially, there might be a capital payment available to some farmers, you know, the basic payment scheme that's been phased out. Um, I'm actually out of touch with this, but one of the, the um, proposals from government is that some farmers could choose to take that as a lump sum rather than taking it as a gradual reduction over seven years. 
you know, to help get younger yeah. generations into farming, for example, or these these people who are over 60, some of them into their 80s were still farming. Mm. And as you say, it's a, it's a tough existence, both, I think, emotionally and physically and, and definitely financially. Um, some of the small grants over, a, say, a 500 hectare farm must add to a fairly significant sum. How important are the grants cumulatively to annual farm income? And I guess that's more so in, in the Dales we're thinking of in the Uplands. Yeah, so Upland Hill farmers, um, there are some good figures available, um, which I can um, dig out the links to and share them after the, if you like, Jeff, if you want to share them with people. But, um, Thank you. So if you're an Upland Hill farmer, their largest proportion of their income, unfortunately, is basic payment scheme in the agri-environment. It isn't actually the profit they make from the business because a lot of them are running at a loss currently. Um, there's a gentleman called Chris Clark who you might, uh, remember he's moved south but um he was um, based at outer shore up at upper up wharfdale um chris um was perhaps not a typical hill farmer he came he came as a farm manager from a lowland area and bought a hill farm and him and his wife ran the business as a tourism business as well as a farm um but he he went down that the, the agri environment route of environmental support but he also started to because he was a businessman he started to look at the figures as well and he he started to glean just from his own experiences that there was a limit to how much you could keep adding inputs into a farm before he got past the threshold of profit and started making a loss and and he's actually been carrying out assessments on um, with other farmers as well in the Deville and Yorkshire Dales and other parts of the country so those figures are actually available as a report and follow-ups so it's worth looking at some of those. They are, and I think one of his main conclusions were that there were virtually no upland farms that were viable without subsidy, and many weren't viable with it without other income from, as you say, tourism or, or whatever. So, uh, you know, really, really puts in stark view as the, as the subsidies change as well, of, the, of those challenges. Um, in, in terms of sort of scale of interest from farmers, how many of the just over a thousand farms of the national in the national park is your team engaged with and do you ever feel how many it could be if you have more resource do you know i have no idea <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> obviously that that figure includes um the area that was added to the national park as well in 2016 so um again if you want me to try and find out some figures i can get back to you about that but i suspect you know the percentage might be 30, 40% of farmers. It's hard to okay. say, really. But I'm, I'm, no, I'm so it's, it's kind of that middle level. It's not 5%, but it's not 80%, yeah. is it, I guess. It's, yeah, yeah. It's a fair few. And um, when you talk about the, some of these newer programmes, like farming in uh, protected landscapes, that's been open a few months now. Would you say the level of interest is such that the funds allocated will get spent up pretty quickly or should people be thinking actually there's still an opportunity here and, and plenty more chance for more people to, to look into that and submit applications? Yeah, definitely still time. And we, we were able to definitely gave approval um, that the we were able to reprofile our budget. So initially, and there'd been a set budget for the first year of over a million for the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority. It was launched quite late in July. Um, we obviously didn't have all the staff in place. All the processes took a while to, uh, to get set up. And we're still finding out and learning about eligibility. And, you know, there are delays inevitably about getting people to get quotes, about getting assessments, etc. So... The budget for the first year now is 300,000 for the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority with a figure offered, but it's not being definitely confirmed of 1 million for the second year and nearly the same for the third year. So you're quite right. There's definitely an opportunity for farmers still to, to put expressions of interest in, have a chat with us and consider for second and third years. Um, as well as capital grants, there are revenue payments available through that programme as well. And as a, a complete non-expert, I got the impression that the application paperwork and process for the farming and protect, protected landscapes was a lot less than some of the fairly mind-blowing forms and categories that farmers do obviously need help with from the older schemes. Is that right? Uh, it is. Um, we're just losing it. We've lost a bit of time because it's taken us a while to get 
those processes embedded in terms of consultations internally and externally, but also about um, recognition of what is eligible and what isn't and about how you improve okay. your score. So the applications are scored across those four themes that we spoke about in terms of climate, nature, people and place. Um, so if somebody's submitting an application that's only fulfilling one of those themes, we then need to think about value for money and prioritization, for example, or whether we can have a conversation and they could perhaps expand their ideas a little bit. It's, uh, but you're right in that um, it's an ongoing um, agreement offer. So the, the, there aren't set dates when the agreements start. There can be rolling start dates and, and finish dates as well. Is there a minimum land holding that can be that's required for that? No, there's no minimum land holding there. Because I know in, in the Yorkshire Rewilding Network, we do have a number of projects that are probably described as small holder, sort of a 10 to 20 acres yeah. size and or hectares. Um, and I think that's a possible opportunity for them if they've got something that um, they want to do, it's worth looking into that programme and see if they meet the criteria as a possible possible start out. Um, a yeah. couple, more, couple more questions just come in, if I may. Um, for the more demanding options, such as restoration of species, rich grassland, how much support do you give once the agreement's underway? Do you visit annually or is it more hands off than that? Ooh, we don't really have the capacity to re um, revisit annually. Um, so between the National Park staff and the volunteer support, the Millennium Trust, um, and sometimes, um, you know, connection with the Wildlife Trust, um, the, they can always contact us and we'll do our best. Mm -hmm. And it may be that, you know, probably with something like um, if you were looking at um, hay meadow restoration, you perhaps would be looking at maybe in year three, doing another soil sample and perhaps another assessment because to do it annually perhaps isn't necessary. It's kind of having a, a snapshot a bit further in time and then perhaps having a re-evaluation. So likewise with breeding wader habitat as well. Okay, I'm going to try you with this question, but um, I, I think I know what you'll say. Why do you think farmers choose not to engage with the farm conservation team, given that you help increase their incomes, improve their infrastructure and create more attractive landscapes? Um, no, I think, it, well, I've worked with farmers um, in, in Forest Bowl and, and in Yorkshire Dales, and the, there isn't a lot of difference at the end of the day. A farmer is exactly the same as you and I, isn't it? It's a cross section of society, different personalities, different age groups. Some people are very insular, some people have got very strong views, some people, um, um, peer pressure might influence them. And um, if somebody comes into an area and then does a little bit of work and then disappears, kind of parachutes in and out, they perhaps don't have the confidence of the farming community. Whereas um, I think the why Yorkshire Dales um, does so well, and there obviously will still be farmers who won't engage with the team, but I think why it does so well is the fact it's continuity. There's, there's been a team around since Adrian Shepherd was appointed a long time ago now, more than, more than 20 odd years, or maybe, maybe just over under 30 years ago, and it's evolved. And some of those staff, you know, have been there a long time. And I think it's uh, the trust builds up. You know, it might be that you only have a conversation with somebody about one small thing. And then by the second or third year, they're actually quite comfortable about talking about you know about a bigger picture or about more private things about the way they manage their business that's great thank you and and the last one which is is one of mine i'll confess is a lot of the schemes to date have been really quite prescriptive and about management and objectives and you know very much kind of i guess control um, one of the things I find inspiring about rewilding is that uncertainty about what's going to happen if we give nature a chance. How, how do you think some of the design of future schemes can cope with a kind of a try something and we don't know what will happen approach when you've got public money at stake? It's got an interesting one that I hadn't really thought about that, about public money um, taking that risk, isn't it? It's, uh, mm. I, 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 do believe that there'll be more land available for 
um, whether it's called rewilding or whether it's just change. Um, and it's, it'll happen. It'll happen in small pockets in some areas and in other areas it'll happen in, in bigger, uh, more of a landscape scale. But we still need, we, um, and I, I see we still need a farmed landscape to work within that rewilding structure, because partly because it's about communities, it's about people, it's about cultural heritage, but it's also about some of that land management that's going on currently isn't broken. Some of it's working well, and we don't want to break it and change it, do we? Necessarily. Uh, uh, and I think the challenge is we don't actually know what we're doing is right or wrong, and we don't know what we propose to do is right or wrong. We're kind of taking a little bit of a guess based on current knowledge or instinct, aren't we? Mm. I, I think you're dead right, and uh, it will be fascinating to see how this how this all unfolds going forwards. Um, that's about us at, out, out of time, I'm afraid. And so, thank you ever so much to John for the introduction, and especially to Taria for, I say, what's a really illuminating view on, frankly, for me, the bewildering array of of funding pots and programs and routes that you have to go through to get things, and the changes that are coming but are still uncertain. Um, I would just very briefly like to return to um, the future dates for our webinars. Apologies, as John mentioned briefly, I did put up wrong dates on the intro. Uh, Tim Mackerel is the 7th of December, as I'd said, but it's the 19th of January, not what I'd previously put December, that Tim Tom will be talking about uh, the rewilding aspect of the Yorkshire Peat Partnership. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Thank you all for joining us. Um, if you do have scope to make a small donation, that would be really appreciated uh, via our website on the donate page or look at our Wild 100 Club, which is something we're really trying to promote this year to allow us to extend the reach of what we're doing. But uh, thanks again. Thanks to Taria especially. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at our next event on the...